speaking as the nexus of world and faith is in many ways an attempt to try to put dense language to Landon's work in the world. Landon gave the inaugural lecture last year in which he was pressed, I particularly pressed him, to tell his story, to tell what shaped him, what caused him to move from West Virginia to Freed Hardeman to Heartbeat, to public broadcasting, to speaking to large audiences. And he told that story and told it beautifully. Uh, if you haven't heard it, it's online and I would encourage you to hear it. The committee for this unit includes myself, it includes Lee Camp, it includes, uh, I'll put myself in a senior moment here, uh, our buddy at ACU, Richard Beck, it includes Kathy Pulley, it includes, Land it includes Landon, ex officio of course, <coughs> meaning he can talk but he can't vote. <coughs> uh, am I missing anybody? Oh, Mike Cope. Uh, this committee met for a retreat in Vermont this past fall to plan this session. And uh, during that, discussed all sorts of alternatives. Uh, Landon kind of protested at one point that being pressed to do the narrative he did last year, he didn't get a chance to really say what he wanted to say about what he thinks about the world and the way we ought to be moving in it. Toward the end of our time, Kathy Pulley suggested that Landon should have a chance to have that say. And so we concluded that, yeah, that sounded about right. So Landon will give the second lecture. But on behalf of the committee, I want to promise you, he will not be given the main lecture again. This is it. There will be other voices. So here's the way the session will work. I'm about to turn it over to Landon. Uh, I'm not, I don't believe in long introductions. You know who he is. And uh, he will speak for up to 40 minutes. Uh, then we will have responses. Uh, from uh, Lee Camp and from uh, Lauren Smeltzer White. Uh, following their responses, I'm going to ask them, they don't know this yet, I'm going to ask them to respond to each other's response. What they heard, what they found interesting, what they found problematic. They've been invited because of our expectation that they will have somewhat of a different take on Landon's speech. We hope that provides fodder for audience thought so that our larger discussion period will be more fruitful. I'll play the role of a strong moderator, meaning uh, I will take the questions. They will come to me. If I think they move us in a productive direction, I will forward them. If I think they take us down a blind alley or take us outside the scope of what this unit is trying to do, I will politely suggest that that's a better question for another unit or another time. I also will reserve the right to reframe a question slightly so that it might move in a more productive area. So if you'll grant me that right, it gives us the possibility of having a lengthy discussion period which we've built into the schedule and one that is productive. That's what you can expect. Landed.
the problem, um, one of the problems, there are several, but one of the problems, James said, that I didn't get a say. Uh, he said, huh? I didn't get to say some of the things last year that I'd wanted to say, and the problem is, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> so I had to, I had to, to start over. Um, you know, James, when he said this was the last one that the committee was going to let me to deliver, you know, he may have thought he was insulting me a little bit. That's the best news I've ever heard. <laughs> I don't want to do this again. <laughs> I want to say at the beginning that I do not share the feelings of a lot of people right now about where things are, that this is an awful time, that the world's going to the dogs, the church is basically finished, that we're living in a post-Christian age, and to all of that, I want to say bull hockey. I've been wanting to say that for a long time. I've been around now for 2,000 years. And as I look at the world, I think a lot of it is better. I don't share the world that, or the thought that just everything is, there's less violence in the world. There's less hunger in the world. There's better medicine in the world. We're working on human rights, perhaps in a way that the world hasn't before. That in the midst of whatever darkness there is, there is also something that's going right in the world. Because this is God's creation. And when I look at the church, you know, the truth is, the church is just a messy business. It's just a messy business. But I, 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 I tend to like messy churches a whole lot better than I do churches that are certain. Those certain churches will kill you. And... Once in a while, I hear churches wondering if they're disfellowshipping enough. And I want to say, good Lord, that's a prayer. Uh, our time is an unusual time in which a lot of things are dying and a lot of things are being born and we don't yet know what it is that is being born. But that's where God's people come in. That we are a people of the present oriented to the future. And one of my favorite passages is from Paul that God is a God who brings life to the dead and brings into being things that never were. That's the God that we serve. James taught at Dartmouth for a while, and William Sloan Coffin was still living. And James was invited to a small intimate dinner at Dartmouth that was honoring William Sloan Coffin. And James invited me to go along. But during the course of the evenings, Coffin said that a lot of times preachers would say to him, you know, we, we can't get any publicity. Nobody seems to notice us in our communities. What should we do? And Coffin replied, well, you might try something that's interesting. I want to talk this morning about something that is really interesting. Now, to sort of set the stage, 
we we are living here in the united states in an in an unusual sort of spot because there was a narrative on which the united states was loosely based for most of its history and that was the judeo christian narrative there was a creation a fall there was a coming of christ which ushered in a world with a savior there was a church there would be a final judgment and there would be heaven and hell. What's interesting about that is that that was not a story known only by the religious. This was a story that was also known by the culture. And one could speak even to the general culture about some of these things and they would kind of know where you were. They still had some of the language. They still had some of the content. But that's what's changed. Today, one cannot expect an audience, a general audience, to understand that or to have any idea of sort of where we are when we are using this language familiar to us and content that is familiar to us. And that's why in all of my communications to those outside, if I used a religious term or a biblical term, I never did it without extensive explanation. And sometimes in the explanation, the audience found that that was something that was very, very interesting. Now, there are a lot of influences that have affected the erosion of that narrative on which the country. You have the rise of evolution, and it's talked about more, and it's in the school system. And evolution puts a good deal of pressure on human beings made in the image of God. So what do we do about that? I read E.O. Wilson's, who's the leading, been the leading Darwinian uh, since Darwin, I guess. He wrote a little book, The Meaning of Human Existence. And I thought, I wonder what that sounds like coming from someone who is Darwinian to the core. And it was kind of a mixed thing. There were some things in there that I found very challenging and interesting. Things maybe I could use. Then you have the rise of, of cosmology and the astrophysics in ways that we just haven't known before. Nancy Abrams, who's married to Joel Premack, who is one of the leading cosmologists of the world, recently wrote a book entitled A God That Could Be Real, in which she was trying to look at what we know about the universe right now and then come up with some sort of an idea of God that might work in that context. I didn't agree with all of her conclusions, but I found it very interesting. Then she and her husband just released a little book, The New Universe and the Human Future. And then think of the impact of the neurobiological and psychological sciences that have unveiled and revealed things about who we are and about human behavior that we did not have the tools to access ever before in history. And so we're, we're trying to look at that and accommodate and see how this fits with the story that we love so well. And then you look at the influence and impact of globalism and pluralism that have changed the very nature of virtually every community across this country that now the world that was over there is now next door. And the religions that were over there are now our neighbors. And so all of that changes things, and then you add to that technology and communication theory and how we interact with each other. These are all really major changes. And then you add to that list the rise of secularism and a kind of exclusive humanism that is intellectually defensible. And that changes things. It's no longer sort of that strange atheist over there in my little community who had a peg leg and ate a burnt possum. That caricature of the atheist is, is no more. It is a respectable thing, and chapters are being opened all across this country. And then the social issues 
the LGBT issues that are so much in the headlines today. Things that we know that we really didn't know before. The issues of same-sex marriage, the role and place of women, questions of religious freedom, who gets to be free and where does the freedom actually sit, questions of immigration, questions of education, what's taught in the schools, whether there should be prayer in the schools, sex education, transgender issues. But what I want to say this morning is, this was my audience. I made all of this my audience. This is the world. And we don't have the option of choosing our world. And God's love for the world isn't interrupted at certain times in the history because the world got too bad. We don't get to choose our world, but we do get to choose whether or not we will love the world that we have as God loves that world. We do have that choice. Now, there have been sociological impacts from this. In religion, in this country, we're experiencing diminishing numbers. The nuns are rising and are now the second largest religio-political group in the United States. We are watching the loss of our young as they flee churches, and we're looking at an aging church. Almost every conference, every church, you, you, you see fewer young and more who are older. I'm glad they love older people. There. And then you look at the churches forming ungodly political alliances. It is as if the power that rests in us is insufficient and now we have to reach over here and form alliances with whatever political ideology that happens to suit our theology. And then you wonder where the theological students are. People who are being trained and equipped to meet our world. James teaches a class, I think it's faith integrating the culture. If they're in practice, okay. And so he, he gave his students, the graduate students, theological students, the abstract for this lecture and asked them to respond. And uh, said to them, respond around two questions. Number one, do you know how to talk to people who are outside the religious sphere, to nuns, to atheists, to humanists, etc.? And the second question was, do you think your training has prepared them to do that? And I'll just excerpt a little. One said, Free, I feel that religious communities need to internalize is that they have failed some people. And that's a big reason why you see people flooding out of churches and finding what they need elsewhere. Another said, my fears reveal the extent to which there lacks good dialogue between the religious and the secular fears. Should we try to cultivate more universal language that might translate amongst very religious and non-religious audiences? Another one says, responses to church saying serve as ways so often to alienate and provide greater distance between the in-group and the out-group. I do not mean to say that epistemology and soteriology are not important, but if a theologian is not able to leave the inaccessible ivory tower language to bridge gaps for practitioners, perhaps their education has done them a disservice. Another says, here, meaning in their university, I see many students who are in dire need of education that informs them in how to engage all people 
Another says, in a way to answer the question, if I feel prepared to engage non-religious people on their terms, I would have to say no. Growing up in the church, the only way I was taught to engage non-religious people was with a posture of I am right and you are wrong. I was never taught to engage with non-religious uh, ways of speaking about what is meaningful because their meanings were always illegitimate and wrong. And so why would I spend time secularizing my Christian values when I am right and when my goal is to convert others to my way of thinking? These are the people we're training. Are we training to deal with the world as it is? And so the question before us is what to do? How to respond? What should the church do? And you, we've had the Jesus Seminar. James Davison Hunter wrote a book to change the world and his solution was what he called faithful presence. You got Dreyfus and Kelly, two philosophers who are very concerned about the loss of the sacred in the world and are urging a return to the Western classics in an interesting little book entitled All Things Shining. And one of the latest making the rounds, especially among evangelical circles, is Rod Drower's The Benedict Option. But the question is, do we pull back from the world? Do we withdraw? Or do we engage? And I want to say that those who seem to advocate withdrawal, they're not really saying that they don't want to engage the world. And those who are saying we engage the world, they're not really saying that we don't need a deeper, richer church. I'm for both of those. The question is, how to get there. I, and consequently, this lecture series, come down firmly on the side of engaging the world. The description of this lecture series is that we read the text of the world with the same fervor we read the text of faith. And therefore, as faith has an epistemological role, the world also has an epistemological role. The world is viewed not as an object or a background, but as a context in which we relate to every human being on earth. So why do I think that? Why do I think that engaging the world is the way that we ought to go? First of all, I just look at Jesus. Jesus came not to the church but to the world. He came to earth, and then what he did when he got here, where he located his work, in the streets, and the people who knew of him, they would bring the sick and the infirm and lay them down in the streets, in the marketplace, because they knew Jesus would come by there. And he said, you are the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. And he said, go to all nations and to every creature. That's why I like engaging the world. It seems that that's what Jesus came. And then you look at Paul's example, crossing boundaries beyond the Jewish world and becoming all things to all men. And after several chapters in which he deals with our relationship to outsiders, he said, be imitators of me even as I imitate Christ. In other words, as I walk among outsiders, I learned how to do that from Jesus and you learn how to do that. And for me, these were not just texts to preach on. This was who I had to become. I had to learn what it was like to become a Muslim 
to Muslims. I had to learn what it was like to become gay to a person who was gay. I had to understand what it was like to become a secularist to those who are secular. Becoming all things to all men is not just a text. It's a way to be in the world. I had to get inside that kind of skin and to be that. And you know, I found that really interesting. And thirdly, given the intimate connection between faith and world that we find in Jesus, salt of the earth, light, and leaven, each is saved only in engagement with the other. And yes, the salt must not have lost its savor, and light cannot have become darkness, and leaven must not lose its power, but each retains its true nature in relationship to Christ, and let me add, that when it retains its true nature in relationship to Christ, it means that it retains that by finding it in God's love for every creature on earth and in Jesus Christ who became human to be with humans in a redemptive way. Bonhoeffer said, Christ is only Christ in the midst of the world. And if Christ is only Christ in the midst of the world, then the church is only the church in the midst of the world. And so let me say a few, a, a few things about how we do it. There's a church audience. It's an audience that I know well. It's an audience that I love. And whatever else I've done in the world, I've never forgotten my love for the church and I've gone to do service. But over 40 years ago, I made this one of these. I looked out over 300, 400, 500, up to 15, And you walk out there, and you're very impressive when you stand in the whole church. But when I stood before 1,500 people drawn from all the acts of life, this is the new technology. Some of you may not be able to see this because we still get into the This is. But in my audience, in my audience, those with no religious beliefs, in my audience were secularists, in my audience were gays, in my audience were same-sex couples, in my audience were women who had had abortions, in my audience were New Agers and Muslims and Buddhists with all kinds of racial mix. That was my audience. There are men standing before that audience. What do you say? How do you engage that? Do you single out certain of these and do massive lectures on that? Lectures of condemnation, fear. What do you say? when you stand before that audience. And I would just say here, would God speed the day when more people of God are putting themselves before that audience? How can things ever change if we're not talking to these people? So I just want to focus on two things. I'm not a specialist in theology. Everybody knows that. I've arrived at any theology that I have but just digging it out of the dirt. Just digging it out. Constant, sustained engagement with the world. On all of these. Uh, 
in the press. So let me address those two things. First of all, it feels to me like that the world plays a rather significant role in the development of theology. And I'm concerned about the way the religious are perceived as looking at the world. To enter the new frontier, to talk to this audience, you'd better stand up with an exciting view of the world, with something that is interested. How can we begin with a dark vision, with fear and dread and timidity and judgment? There's nothing interesting in that. In my own case, to engage the world in public spaces, I had to change profoundly the way I viewed the world, from a kind of religious view that I had inherited to what I hope is a more biblical view. Dr. Paul Sampley, one of the world's foremost polling scholars, James introduced him to me in the 90s, and he's become one of my close conversation partners for the work. Recently, he wrote a brilliant essay entitled, Living in an Evil Inn, Paul's Ambiguous Relation to Culture. I'd recommend it to all of you. He states, quote, the translation of Ian as world is unfortunate because it contributes to a non-Pauline, proto-Gnostic denigration of the world as God's creation. I grew up hearing in church that this denigration of the world was correct. That's what we should do, that the world was evil, and if we get too close, we'll get contaminated. Judgment and condemnation, these are the watchwords that we use for the world. But just stop That's an awful way to begin a relationship, don't you think? Apply that romantically. You see somebody you're interested in, and you say, you're a mess. You are totally condemned, but I could fix you. How about a date? Instead, I think we must see the world as God's creation that sparkles everywhere with God's touch and we are gloriously engaged in the work of creation. You know, if the world has seven billion people in it, and if every one of them is made in the image of God, that's a lot of God in the world, isn't it? Maybe we would find it interesting to look at that thing. I love the asides in a speech. But this opened the way for me to see that loving God really means loving the world. It's the only place we have to do it. For God so loved the world, open the question, what does it mean for God to love every human being on earth? This question is tough, sticky, nasty, mind-twisting. But if you stay with it, it'll change your life. It opened the way for me to realize that all the various systems of philosophy and, and religion, these are only names given to what struggling human beings have identified as ways that they're trying to live. They're just trying to find meaning for their lives. Almost none of them was on a mission to be heretical. And I came to see that God was at work in every place on earth, in philosophy and religion and science and education and the arts, in any and every place where any good existed, God was there. And that opened up a new world of meaningful relationships with human beings in all walks of life. In the essay by Paul Sampley that I just mentioned, he wrote, quote, so how can it be surprising that Paul, in his missionary efforts to win some of those outside the law, had no choice but to use categories, conceptions, perceptions, and inclinations that were familiar to non-Jewish audiences, 
Communication simply continues, begins with taking one's hearer precisely in the context where they are. Paul is a careful observer of the way the world works, he continues. He knows how the world operates, how the way the world works. He knows how it operates, how power works, how things happen. And he says, continuing, I find Paul a refreshing alternative to those today who so dearly and carefully guard the gospel from what they consider contamination and who would have it as their goal to repristinate Christianity. He continues, Paul never found a Greek notion that he didn't like and that he couldn't domesticate into service of the gospel, though tweaking it or torquing it a bit or a great deal in light of the gospel. He continued to say, the key, once Paul understood that the gospel not only did not call from a wholesale retreat from the world and its practices, but also allowed, yes, even encouraged engagement of the world, then the door was open for his creative, if even if ambiguous, relation to the culture and its categories. End of quote. It's very interesting to me that Paul never singled out a big philosophy or religion to denigrate or condemn. Stoicism was the religion of the land. He never once called it by name. Never once. That's interesting. Sampley pointed out rather that he, quote, he picked and used various ideas that suited his purposes drawing upon the vast riches of the culture like a concert organist playing a multi-console instrument. And we face many philosophies. But how are we going to do that? Are we going to call them out, name them, denigrate, hold lectures, condemn them? Or do we get inside those, take the time to learn what's there and find the common ground ground on which you can further the aims and vision of the gospel of Christ. It seems to me like that we should look more carefully at how Paul did this and that that might opt for a better way. So I think we've got to reframe that connection to the world. There's a lot more to say there. The second thing, though, is looking toward a theology for public spaces. What's it look like? And again, I want you to look at this one. If you start out with God's uncompromised love for every one of these, what do you say? Where do you begin? And I'm pausing just a moment. I want you to feel the angst, the fear the doubt that was in someone like me who wanted to say something for God that would be good news for such a moment. And it's a bit odd what happened to me after a lot of thought and ranging over many possibilities, one place emerged with greater power than I had ever seen it before. And that's the answer Jesus gave when asked, what's the great commandment? And Jesus said to love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, everything hangs on the 
Is this the connection to the world? That was my question. If Scripture has redemption as aim, and if it all comes down to this, might this be the connection? And then turning to Paul, who took the gospel across cultural boundaries to the world, he said twice, once in Romans, once in Galatians, that it all is summed up in one commandment. To love your neighbor as yourself. And I began to conclude that this must be the foundation stone on which theology rests. But there's still a question. How could I connect this to this audience? I couldn't announce a lecture on the great commandment. I doubt if that would have drawn this audience. I couldn't announce a lecture on loving your neighbor as yourself. That probably wouldn't have gotten any traction. And so what I decided to call it, looking at the great commandment, was feeling good about yourself. And I followed that with life that loves to happen, no matter what happens. And with that, the people in this audience came. They came by the hundreds to three consecutive evenings with audiences growing each evening all across this country awakening and tapping into the great hunger that people have for what really matters. And so I built the first evening on the theme of the value of a human being because this to me captured the essence of God's love and the gift of Jesus Christ. And I found it to be a rich and exhaustible theme and it connected with this one. The second night was built on the theme of relationship, neighbor, and self. Get this right, and life can be deep and rich. And here again is an inexhaustible theme that may be one of the most needed themes in our world today, and it connected. The third night was built on joy, which I posited as the most profound way to navigate the world, the world of self and relationship and surprise and failure and loss and violence and disappointment and terrorism and fear and death. There was no question that these messages connected with this audience. And over 40% of them agreed to go to small groups to continue studying what really matters for three months. Some of those groups continued for years. This affected how I began to see church. And I'd like to say just a word about the life of the one who speaks to such an audience. When I stood up in church, I was granted the benefit of the doubt based on knowledge of the Bible reputation. But when I stood up before this crowd, they didn't know me and I didn't know them. So what did they see? They saw a person who had a view of the world oozing out of every pore of my skin. They saw a person full of all the scripture that I had studied, all the theology I'd read, all the ways I'd involved myself in the world, my readings and the science and philosophy and the arts and novels, all of that deepening the life and the heart of the one who stood up to speak. And it all affected my bearing, the tone of my voice, the look in my eyes, and the words that came out. I did not try to be clever. I was not a peddler of God's Word. I had no hidden agenda. But I tried to speak as one of sincerity sent from God and standing in his presence. 
And the people who heard accorded me a certain sense of authority. I was often told we've heard others who said some of the same things you say, popular speakers, that you sound different than I was. So let me sum up with a fuller relationship to a theology that is in the shape of a human being. Jesus' summation of all scripture to love God, neighbor, and self as the foundation of theology, it's about God and the world and relationship. And to build a house of theology on this foundation embraces every aspect of theology and the world it's wiring and plumbing and measurement and walls and floors and ceilings and windows. The house of theology built on this foundation will be a theology for human beings, will attract human beings, will fit human beings, and will welcome human beings. It will celebrate, it will nurture children and welcome neighbors and strangers. Theology's relationship to the world is and must remain an intimate one. And theology has great flexibility and resiliency as it moves and dances with its partner. It looks for God in the world, in the life of every human being in the audience. And it looks for ways to connect and expand and deepen convictions. And it brings God near to everyone that we come near. It looks at Christ and sees Him in relationship with human beings here on earth. It looks at His presence with another person. It looks at His appeal and how He talked about things that matter most with men and women, knowing that when this is done well, it brings to the lips the words, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He looks at atonement and finds first the human Jesus that shows us what atonement looks like in human form and relationship, how it sees, how it talks, what it says, bringing it to life in the way we know how to be with each other. He looks at ecclesiologies and sees it showing forth God's wisdom and love as it provides a safe place for the kinds of people Jesus attracted and religion rejected as it embodies what it means to live together in the interest of others, the very essence of the church. It looks at eschatology as addressing what every human being yearns for, hope. And it offers that hope without equivocation, not as an argument, but as a faith that places greater value on life than it does on death. Theology finds what matters most in human life and dances with the world in that rhythm. It offers human being a yoke that is easy and a burden that is light. It's theology in the key of life, in the key of a human being. And so before us is our world not to hate, but to love. And in that love for the world, I found myself, my life and work. I found my mothers and my fathers, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews. But most of all, I found my neighbor. And that was really interesting. Thank you. Landon turns 80 next month. Don't you hope you can find that sort of grace and outlook in your 80th year.
I heard. I first responded to Lee Camp. Uh, Lee teaches here at Lipscomb. Uh, we have asked him to respond because this is his bailiwick. He studied at Notre Dame with Yoder, and folks like Yoder and Hauerwas are his friends and enemies. He knows the discipline well. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Landon. I, uh, I'm very fond of Landon Saunders, and I, uh, the time I've gotten to spend with him over the last couple of years, uh, I have loved, and uh, meals with him and conversation with him, and as Landon speaks of reading the text of the world, I, I pause a moment to, to speak of my reading of the text that is Landon, and I would say I've always found this sort of immense and broad hospitality in him. And it's a sort of cultured hospitality that one expects to find more uh, from an Episcopalian and an old Church of Christ boy that I've always found enjoyable and delightful. And I think one of the reasons I also resonate uh, personally with Landon is because I hear in him and hear here in his experience uh, things that I experienced in some ways myself uh, as a boy in deep south churches of Christ uh, that on the unhealthy side of that uh, not forgetting the healthy side of it, but on the unhealthy side of it. You know, I kind of share his sense that the Christian tradition has too often wounded the weary and has too often beaten the already brokenhearted. And for all the ways Landon has sought to rectify those ills, I celebrate what he has sought to do and what he has done in his work and in his person. Uh, responding to what he shared today, and also I, I, probably inevitably sharing uh, some of the things I've heard Landon say through the years, maybe some of that's mixed in with what I'll share over the next uh, eight minutes I've got. But I think one of the things I often find myself is, um, is wanting, uh, I'll put these in our two broad heads, and then I'll, I'll set up kind of three major subpoints under this. My two broad heads are this first. Uh, I, like, I would like to hear more specificity. I want to know more about what Landon means by some of the things that he says. For example, uh, in my mind, it's more helpful to have more specificity about what do we mean by the world? What do we mean by the human being? What do we mean by the love of God? And I'll come back to some of those in a moment. A second sort of broad head I want to raise is sometimes it's hard for me to tell whether Landon is primarily describing for us, prescribing for us a posture or is he making a theological argument? Now, I know quite well that form can't be separated from function, and so in some ways that's a false dichotomy, right? But at the same time, that, there is a distinction to be made between strategy on the one hand and theology on the other hand. And sometimes I can't tell which ends of that spectrum. world as a whole, nor do we withdraw from it as a whole. It's always a selective discernment. There are some practices of the world that we say, we celebrate this. There are other practices of the world that we say, at, we're Christians, we don't do that kind of stuff, right? So it's always just like, my third one and then I'm done. Um, I think we should assume that we will best know how to engage the agnostic or the atheist or the nun, not by looking for some lowest common denominator universal language or some supposed universal human experience, but first be more schooled in the particularities, the soaring beauty of the great Christian tradition that will then set us free to read the text of the particular community in which we find ourselves and then to engage to the degree the situation allows it peaceable and reconciling dialogue and relationship by which we bear witness to what we believe to be true and good and liberating and listen with open hearts to what our dialogue partner has to say to us. And then finally, let what we learn become the stuff of our hermeneutical matrix by which we continue to humble ourselves, learn afresh, and repeat. Thank you.
Our next respondent is uh, Lauren Smeltzer White. We chose Lauren, uh, a PhD student at Vanderbilt, to be a respondent based on a recent Harvard Theological Review essay she wrote that seems relevant to questions about uh, engaging the world. Fine. Thank you. I'm also um, very honored to be responding to Landon's address today, and as well as to Lee. Uh, I don't know how comfortable I am with the thought that I'm supposed to disagree with Lee, uh, but I, you know, I can I can give that a shot. Um, I'm also excited to be one of the earliest participants in this annual lecture series, which I think is, um, you know, uh, an attempt to work towards something like what Landon is calling for. Uh, so I too would like to remark upon certain aspects of his lecture that I find particularly noteworthy or promising, and then move on to flag a couple of issues that I think bear clarifying, and then close by reflecting upon what could be needed for furthering this labor towards an effective public theology. Uh, we may summarily say that Landon's vision of public theology is fundamentally concerned with the nature of Christian mission, I think. His understanding of that mission grows out of the way that he hears the Bible's call to love God and neighbor without reservation, according to which he invites us to two unwavering commitments. The first is welcoming embrace of every human being, however strange to us, and second is intimately engaging the unconverted, whom he calls the world, by reading their texts with the same passion with which we read the text of faith. And I was reminded at this point uh, of Karl Barth's image of the Christian properly being one who always has the Bible in one hand and the world's, the, the day's newspaper, I should say, in the other, and looking for the way that God's word speaks into every historical situation. I think that sort of gets at the texture of public theology that Landon is speaking to. For Landon, evangelical Christians, and maybe Christians in general in the West, I wasn't always clear on that, but they've fallen short of this task to say the least. In some sense, that can be attributed to the fact that they haven't taken seriously enough what the dwindling numbers in our churches mean and what the, the dwindling affiliation with religion in general means, which is the shift away from uh, what I would say is a, a deistic framework towards uh, that of secularist humanism. And I think this is a great point, that it's time for us to take this seriously. He also convincingly argues that it's time for church types to come to terms with this shift, not by retreating. And I guess if I were gonna ask for clarification from you, Lee, I'd, I'd wanna know in what sense you think there is some call for some to do that, that kind of retreat. Um, nor should we join together in something like hostile voting blocks, but rather this is an exciting opportunity for innovation, for creativity, for courage, and ultimately I think Landon's calling us to trust and the divine promise that in Christ, God is still making all things new. That trust enables us to listen, really listen, to other religious and philosophical systems, guided by confidence that God is at work there, in any place where the good exists. And for actually carrying this out, I think the example of Paul's ambiguous creative relationship with culture is a generative one. If Paul didn't try to guard the gospel from the contamination by other discourses, then we too are free to do that same sort of work. Um, listening to an unconverted audience, not only for explaining our faith, but even expanding it. I think that's an important uh, insight. Landon identifies another constructive standard for our public theology and that it should be publicly or properly oriented towards delight. I find that uh, a really lovely aspect of this. That this is a message that should be one that draws people in and that calls them to a way of life that is welcoming and celebratory. And part of what I found appealing in this is there's a call here to attend to our desires and longings themselves as a site of theological disclosure. And uh, those of us who've thought about this much, which is probably many of us here today, know that this has long been neglected by the Protestant theological tradition. On the whole, Landon's vision strikes me as especially exigent for educators, 
not just in academics but also in congregations and i appreciate his framing it as such at certain points he calls educators to see that christians need to be equipped and emboldened to engage all sorts of theological and philosophical positions conversationally and that part of that equipping entails expanding our range of empathy by way of imaginative exercises. So all of this I find highly compelling, but there are some points uh, likely that I, I would want Landon to speak to, to clarify. And uh, Landon warned us and when he sent us his manuscript that he might do a little bit of improv and adaptation. And so I, I kind of hung my hat on one statement he made in the manuscript he sent that I didn't actually hear him say today. <laughs> But he, I think it is a good one that sort of sums up his view of theology, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to it anyway. In the manuscript he sent, he said, there cannot be two theologies, one for insiders and one for outsiders. Theology, by its very nature, is born in its design for the salvation of the world. And my, my slight, you know, what I, what I want to hear more of is what are we talking about when we say theology? And part of a, well, there, there's several angles on this that I think bear clarification. One of them is that, I, and very simply, when we say that theology is always public, um, and this is something that, that Lee affirms, so he could probably speak to this as well, um, I think that in, there are many senses in which that's true. However, um, there is a, also a sense in which theology is very simply just the sort of laying out of the grammar of belief in special revelation. And in that sense, it is very much born of and for the interests of insiders. Theologians are, you know, kind of looking at what people who pray are praying to and what they're praying about and what they're talking about. And so there's a sense in which that theology is an insider uh, game. And is that wrong? Is there a sense in which the uh, doing that with a mind towards the outsider is necessary. I'd, I'd just like to hear more about that, that, that sense of theology. Um, and then I also think there are some who are sympathetic to Landon's project who might push back at this language of theology being born for the salvation of the world. And what I think this highlights is there's a sort of a tension in the way Landon approaches our mission, uh, that it's one of saving the world. I think he's pretty clear about that. We have something to offer that is salvific. Um, at the same time, we are called to listen to the world. We're called to allow the world to critique us, the unconverted, when I would say the world. And so I, I think some people would say, if you start by assuming that theology is to save the world, you're not starting in a listening posture. You're starting at the, with this assumption that it needs saving. And so I guess I, I would like to hear Landon talk about how he maintains this, this vision of uh, that we as people of the cross have something saving to bring to the world, but also want to, how, how do we maintain this posture of assuming that we have something to gain as well? Now, in closing, I, I also wonder if uh, this theological vision and labor could be enhanced by further concreteness, I'm with Lee in that, uh, to the notion of loving every human being, and particularly by anticipating a challenge that's always going to confront us in that effort that as we all know, loving all persons unconditionally and inviting them to share the delights of discipleship gets complicated when it comes to the fact that we are inviting them to live a crucified life. In presenting a public alternative to secular hedonism, for instance, there inevitably comes a point at which we must give account of which pleasures Christians say yes to and which ones we say no to in the cruciform journey towards the ecstasies of full communion with God. If the truth of which we are convicted does not, on the world's terms, seem to be loving, how are we to proceed? It seems to me that some of the work to be done is our articulating some criteria for evaluating ideologies we encounter in the world. That is, for identifying the good in all things and for saying no to the idolatrous trajectories. This effort at, at coming up with some criteria is gonna be complicated because of this commitment to re remain open to the discourses that we encounter critiquing us and showing us new angles of beauty, goodness, and truth. In light of that complication, it seems that the challenge of speaking to the world in love and truth is not only intellectual, but it is also spiritual 
It finds us begging the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom only God can afford. So perhaps most importantly, we should also work to identify some specific practices that invite the Spirit into our efforts to listen and speak compellingly to an unconverted public. And on this account, I believe that Landon Saunders has much more to teach us. Over the years of his ministry, people have been drawn to him because of his message of acceptance and hope, certainly. But those of us who've spent time with him know that people have trusted his message because of who he is. He is an incarnational theologian. He has lived a cruciform life, and he also exudes a contagious joy and peace. In this regard, Landon's way of being teaches us that our theological labors may gain public traction if they are carried out by people who are, like Landon, captured by a great passion for God's creation. Thanks. As a strong moderator, I'm going to revoke my earlier uh, suggestion that I would give them an opportunity to speak to one another. That's gone. <clears throat> what I will ask is that uh, Landon, uh, Lauren, and Lee all come stand up here uh, uh, together right now. <laughs> uh, people think twice before they ask me to moderate a session again. Uh, questions from the audience, comments? Three. Um, I agree with them. <laughs> that brief <laughs> No, I, I'm very, very sensitive to life and specificity of people. Um, part of the reason is the way my life is in uh, Carissa, Jim's daughter, is currently pouring through a lot of communications that I've done. And she's trained sort of theologically to see what fits and doesn't. And she's done two lectures on what she's done so far. So I think I, I, I think it does need specificity and I hope that in the community that it can Sounds like I'm giving a plug for my daughter, but those two lectures were given at Pepperdine uh, recently and I guess will appear or soon appear on uh, their website. Uh, other questions? Yes. Each use the phrase, probably I'll turn to land and just uh, uh, to respond to that. You know, Lee's talking about the particularity of the human being and the differences that are there, which I absolutely support. Um, my view would be very sensitive to that particularity and would try to adapt as I went along to that. Um, the salvation of the world, you know, I use in what feels to me like kind of a general expression that's found in Scripture. That the world is here, there is an evil in, sort of in the world that human beings interact with and have to deal with in, in terms of God's creation. And that, that overall, that has affected me and makes me long for not salvation of the world in which all the world suddenly is sort of flowing this way. Though I do think at times uh, the people of God can behave in a way that does sort of make others want to flow there. I think it's interesting to ask what did the Stoic find in Paul's message so compelling 
and attractive that they were willing to give up lifelong commitment and certain practices in a certain way and sign on for something that's very new. I'm going to interrupt yes. this one because we just don't think okay. it's time okay. to, to, to take a question this I'm morning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes. I'll take that one. Uh, the, the Stoics and Epicureans are more complicated than that in terms. That's correct. And that is the, 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 the bad is, uh, is fear of death. And the gods are... Uh, uh, need to be taken out of the equation because of what they contribute to the fear of death. Uh, the Stoics a little more complicated in terms of their recycling views and uh, 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 at the same time you might find Paul in common with the Epicureans in that they are our closest analog to Pauline communities in the ancient world that the Epicurean garden brought people of common interest and who nurtured one another into a community. We don't realize how uncommon that is in the ancient world. Very, very uncommon. So uh, this is a complicated one as well, and I won't take more time than that, but just to say, uh, good question. Uh, 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 the way Paul uses uh, popular philosophy, the way Paul uses what he could consider uh, uh, available speech in his letters and his work is intimate to me. I'm going to take that one as well, uh, 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 largely because it fits my uh, area of work more closely than the others here. Uh, uh, I think part of what we have to do in this, and part of why listening to the world and thinking about, well, I was trained under the influence of Peter Berger, so I, I have a definition of the world that uh, uh, I won't go into. But um, uh, early Christianity was born in the time of Second Temple Judaism and a, a passage through apocalyptic eschatology that was formative. And principalities and powers and all sorts of ways of thinking about that world 
belong to that period of time. We don't live in a period in which people operate under the assumptions of apocalyptic eschatology. It shows up in belief in heaven and hell, but it does not show up elsewhere. When you have a loved one who has cancer, you call an oncologist, you don't call an exorcist. So the notion of how we think about evil in the world and how we think about principalities and powers means that biblical scholars who can think about what the construction of the world was like in the time of Paul and what the construction of the world is like now and how can somehow negotiate that is going to have to be a part of what uh, reading the text of the world means, reading the text of scripture and reading the text of the world. Uh, I'm not a person who can stand before an audience and say that I view the world the same way Paul did. Yeah, I, 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 um, I find, Carl, your observation very helpful there, and um, because I think that, um, we, yeah, we, call the, we, we do call the oncologist, not the exorcist, but we desperately need ways to describe that there are realities of brokenness, wickedness, evil in the world that are profound, and what, you know, um, and ways to talk about the principalities and powers. We need ways to, to point to the fact that the greatest people on Wall Street in 2008 did not know what had hit them after it hit them. And they realized that there are mechanisms of greed in computer algorithms that are beyond simple human endeavor to precisely put their finger on. Um, and that these things then in turn shape very deeply human desires um, and so that our, our very notions of what we hope for, what we long for, what our desires are, are deeply shaped by these powers. And so I, I, I think you're right. It's, it's not, we're, we're not going to buy all the same sort of ways Paul would, Paul would describe it, but there is some reality out there that um, we desperately need to try to get language to point to. Uh, one more? I guess it depends on where you're receiving your training. Um, I know that it's kind of, it seems to be sort of, uh, there, uh, there's a revived interest in uh, sacramentology and liturgy. Now I think in, in the Church of Christ tradition in particular, there's an interesting uh, phenomenon where we have placed our sacraments on a really high pedestal but haven't done much thinking about them, you know? And so I think there, that, those have in many ways sustained our life together over time, but we it, it bears some thinking through. So I, I'm not sure about uh, the trend there and why, you know, what's happening is happening, but I, I think probably with the, there's a rising interest in materialist worldviews, and I think a Christian response to that is by attending to the power of sacramentology. So I think it, it certainly bears study and further attention. I just 
don't have the words to tell you how delightful it is to hear, hear this conversation. Um, this is what I would most hope for. Uh, I think that if we could come to a vision for our people that would excite, ignite a spark in them again, if we could come with a vision that would capture the hearts and minds of young people today, that would capture the hearts and minds of a brilliant person like Paul, some of which are sitting here in this room this morning, that if we have this discussion, I think it not only responds to what's going on in the world, but I think it might ignite that spark of vision for God's people that make us hopeful and hopeful to sort of everyone we meet. I think that our response must always have a sense of something that's monumental, that is epic, that that's the only kind of vision that has a chance, I think, of capturing uh, the hearts of the people. And I think if we did that, we would have made a great contribution to God's kingdom. I'm really thankful for your responses. I have worked closely with Landon for 30 years. Uh, for 10 years, I got my paycheck from Landon. Uh, but I've worked with him for 30 years. Uh, the impetus for him inviting me into a beginning conversation with him was that we were both speaking together at the Gander Book Summer Youth Camp in Maine. And I gave a lecture on Paul, probably, don't remember. And, um, okay, <laughs> okay, it was on Jesus then. And uh, Landon said, after I was finished, could we take a walk? And so we took a walk in the Maine woods. And what he said was that he'd heard of a lot of people who talked about the ancient world and talked about it as a background for studying tax. And he said, I hear something different in you. He said, what I hear in you is I hear you taking those people seriously. And he said, what I've tried to do is to take those people seriously. That was the beginning of 30 years of sustained conversation. And before Landon sells himself short as being untrained, you will not find a more voracious reader than Landon Saunders. And I would say partly because he has the gift of insomnia. Uh, we try to read together. I can never keep up, ever keep up. Thank you for the session. Thank you for the questions. Thank you to Lauren, to Lee. Thank you, Landon. We're adjourned.